How many people uh, this morning are looking forward to warmer weather? <laughs> oh, a number of you enjoy winter and you don't want it to end. Um, any day now. Uh, spring, spring was supposed to arrive on the uh, 20th of March, 21st of March, something like that. And uh, yet it is still not here. But any day now. Uh, we will be into double digits in terms of temperature. I guess I should take a, a, a quick survey here. How many people think in Celsius? How many people think in Fahrenheit? Wow, we are heavily influenced by the Americans, are we not? Okay, well, uh, so what would that be? Uh, right now we're at like uh, zero degrees or a couple of below, so we're around uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Before you know it, uh, we'll be into the 50s and 60s uh, in, in terms of Fahrenheit. That will be wonderful, right? And before long, uh, we will be into temperatures in the midsummer, and we'll be complaining that it's too hot, right? That's what's going to happen. Uh, we'll get to transition from long sleeves and long pants into T-shirts and shorts and, and probably sandals for some of us. I've actually taken a bit of an affection towards Crocs. You know what I'm talking about? The Crocs thing. They're kind of, they used to be popular. I don't know if they're still as popular, but I, I think they're rather cool. Perhaps you'll go boating, uh, take some time to do some swimming, or just spend the day at the beach, although I don't know why anybody likes the beach with all that sand. Uh, it'll never make sense to me. Uh, how many of you would agree that Whatever you're doing uh, for summer fun, or whether it's, whether it's fun or whether it's work, after a long hot day in the sun, how many of you would agree that it's nice to end the day with some ice cream? You know, a nice ice cream cone or a bowl of ice cream. Uh, 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 do, you have a favorite, do you have a favorite ice cream place that you like to go to with your family? Just shout it out if you have a... Northridge, yeah, the, the, the place out by Cottom, right? The dairy freeze there. That, that place is amazing. Uh, I, 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 I like soft ice cream. And uh, how many people have been out to the dairy freeze out there? Well, I, I like soft ice cream. And, and Northridge is really amazing because they have this magical pool of melted chocolate that when you dip the ice cream cone into the chocolate, it instantly freezes and forms this candy or chocolate shell on your ice cream. And if you want to be really fancy, they will even roll it in peanuts for you, which is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> well, if you like to go uh, for ice cream, uh, most people uh, like to go for ice cream with their family from time to time. You ha will have probably experienced uh, one of the great mistakes that uh, eaters of ice cream often make, especially children. Now, this, this is particularly true for hard ice cream. Um, I, I don't have this in my sermon. I just want to share it with you this morning. I don't know why. But black cherry ice cream, that's my favorite. Uh, but this is particularly a challenge with, with hard ice cream is that when you first get the ice cream cone, and if you're like me, you'd usually get two or three scoops, right? The ice cream cone is a little bit top-heavy. And uh, this often happens with children. They'll, they'll get the ice cream cone, and they'll take that first lick, and the ice cream will fall off the cone onto the ground. Have you ever experienced that before? Now, there's a few things that can happen in that scenario. That's like uh, when, a, when a little kid has the ice cream, they've taken one lick, and the ice cream is on the ground. It's a traumatic situation, right? Usually, it's followed by... Uh, crying, if not instantly, within a few moments. And there's a few things that can happen there. Number one, dad can pick up the ice cream off the ground and flop it back on the cone <laughs> and say, there you go, right? Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but when hard ice cream, any ice cream, falls onto ha hot asphalt, it, 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 it is no longer a nice, beautiful scoop. It's like a, a smushed pile of melting mush. And when you pick it up, there's usually little bits of asphalt in it, right? And you shove that back on the cone. There you go. Uh, probably not going to relieve much in the way of tears there. The second thing that could happen is 
uh, mom or dad or whoever is with them, grandma, grandpa, whoever it happens to be, turns around and goes back and purchases another ice cream cone for the, for the child, right? Or there's a third thing that sometimes happens when the person who is handing out or selling the ice cream witnesses the poor little kid. They would never do this for me. I'm not cute enough, but my kids are cute enough. And they see this happen, and they decide that they will give uh, the child a new ice cream cone at no charge. I don't know about you, but I think option three is the best option there, right? When the storekeeper, out of their generosity and out of their grace, absorbs the cost of the ruined ice cream cone and gives the child a brand new ice cream cone. I I think that's just the, the best outcome there. When something is ruined, you drop an ice cream on hot asphalt and it's ruined. When something is ruined, whatever it may be, it's really nice when you can take it back to the store and explain to them what happened and they give you a brand new item in exchange for the ruined one. That, that, that's really good when that happens. And in some ways, that's a good picture of what God does for people when they accept Jesus as their Savior. In our text this morning, Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 15. Turn there in your Bibles, if you would. We'll spend our time there in God's Word. There's a powerful illustration of a great exchange. This great exchange that takes place when someone comes to the Lord Jesus to be saved from their sin. There's only two lessons I want to bring forward from this text for you this morning. The one lesson is a lesson that we learn about the Lord Jesus. And the second is a lesson that we learn from a man named Barabbas. We actually are introduced to two new people in our text this morning. We haven't met them before in the Gospel of Mark. There's Pilate. He's the governor of Judea. And there's this man named Barabbas. So one lesson I want to point out from the Lord Jesus and one lesson I want to point out from this man Barabbas. Here's what I want us to hear concerning the Lord Jesus. It's this. Although Jesus is condemned, and here's the moment where Christ is condemned, He is completely innocent. Throughout His entire life, Jesus has acted with absolute integrity. He has never once, in all of His years of life, He has never once done anything wrong against any person or against God. Yet, on account of the hatred of evil men, we find Him here on trial for His life. And so we see that even though Jesus is condemned, He's completely innocent. Look with me here at the first five verses of chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led Him away, and handed Him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin, which is the fancy name for the religious rulers or the the elders of the people of Israel, they were kind of the people underneath the Roman government. Uh, Think of them kind of like the mayor of the town uh, rather than the premier of the province. That's kind of how the Sanhedrin worked. And and, and, and Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin, and they had determined long before this trial ever took place that Jesus should be killed. So when we read here that the Sanhedrin reached a decision, they reached that decision a long time ago. In fact, I think it's all the way back, and it's in chapter 3, I think, in the Gospel of Mark, that these guys have wanted Jesus dead. So pretty much through the whole Gospel, uh, the Sanhedrin has wanted to eliminate Jesus. And so in order to do that, they need to bring Jesus to Pilate. And as I said earlier, Pilate is the Roman governor of Judea. He's the one with the real power. Now I think there are two big reasons why the Sanhedrin takes Jesus and brings Him to Pilate. Number one, 
because they are under the authority of Rome and they're not supposed to kill anybody without the approval of the Roman state. It wasn't, it wasn't within their power, or it wasn't supposed to be within their power to put someone to death, and so they bring Jesus to Pilate. But there's a second reason, I think, that they bring Jesus to Pilate, and it's this. They want this to be very public. They want this to be very public. They want Jesus to be discredited so that no one is left thinking that He is the Messiah after He's gone. They want everybody to see Jesus up on the cross. They want everybody to see Jesus died and buried. They want everybody to know that there's no way this man could be the Messiah because he's dead and gone. I love how we see the hand of God in those little details that are shared with us throughout the Bible. The idea that that Jesus... If, if he would have been killed, think about this for a moment, if Jesus had been killed in the middle of the night, say the Sanhedrin sends the guards to the Garden of Gethsemane and they abduct Jesus, they just kill him right there in the middle of the night and they try and hide him away so that no one finds out that they killed him, they just get rid of him. What if they were to do that? Well, if they were to have done it that way, it would be much more difficult to establish the resurrection as a historical fact. There's all kinds of people, there's all kinds of uh, scholars, and there's all kinds of uh, folks who would like to discredit the resurrection of Jesus, and they come up with all kinds of theories to to how to explain that Jesus isn't really raised from the dead. And you know, a lot of the theories that they put forward would be a lot easier to believe if Jesus had been killed in secret. Right? They could have said, well, he just went away. They could have said, well... The Jesus disciples, they, they, they took his body somewhere and, and um, they just made the whole thing up. Or they could say, well, he didn't really die at all, so that we don't know if he was ever raised from the dead. There's all kinds of ways in which if they had killed Jesus in secret, it would make demonstrating the reality of the resurrection much more difficult. But that's not what happens. They don't kill Jesus in secret. This is going to be a very public execution, which makes the resurrection of Christ very, very, I would say, extremely credible. They want this to be public so that everyone will see and listen, God does too. God wants this to be public. He does not want this to take place in secret. He wants everybody to see this so that we'll know that Jesus is really the Messiah. And so they bring the Lord to Pilate, who again is the governor of Judea. He was in charge of the area. Now, a couple things you need to know about Pilate. He was a good politician. In fact, he's probably the longest serving governor of the province of Judea that there ever was in the Roman state. He lasts about 10 or 11 years as the governor of this area. And this was an extremely difficult area to keep under control. There's always uprisings. There's always skirmishes. There's always riots. There's always, kind of, uh, there's always problems in Judea. And it was his job to kind of keep things under control. He was very good at his job. He was a shrewd politician. And he had the capacity, Pilate did, to be very cruel at times. Some of the things that we know of Pilate paint a picture of a man who would be willing to kill people at the drop of a hat if it served his purpose. So here he is. This is the man who has the power to put people to death. And if he were to do that for the Sanhedrin, if he were to put Jesus to death for the Sanhedrin, that would provide these religious leaders with some political cover. It would make Jesus' execution very public, and it would provide some cover for them. You'll remember that when uh, Jesus was speaking against them, they were really angry and they wanted to arrest him and put him to death. But it says in the Gospel of Mark, they didn't do it because they were afraid. You remember that? They were afraid of the crowds. Well, if Pilate puts Jesus to death, then the crowds can't say, oh, you guys did this and you weren't supposed to. No, it would all be very legitimate and they could say, well, Pilate did it. We didn't do it. And so they bring Jesus to Pilate. And notice here in verse 3, it says that the chief priests or representatives from the Sanhedrin 
It says they accused Jesus of many things. Now, I took some time this week as I was preparing this sermon, and I read through the, all the uh, parallel Gospels, the other Gospels, to try and find out what were some of the things that they were accusing Jesus of. And actually, in the other Gospels, you get a, a little bit of the list of the many things they were accusing Jesus of. They were telling the Pilate that Jesus tells people not to pay taxes. You remember that question? They came to Jesus and they were like, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar, Right? And uh, they thought they had Jesus in trouble, and they thought they had him pinned in a corner. And Jesus says, "What is anybody remember what he says? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. So did Jesus ever say, don't pay your taxes? It would be kind of nice if he did, right? <laughs> they accuse him of opposing Caesar, of, of trying to raise people up to to throw the Romans out of town. Did Jesus ever say anything like that that we know of in the Gospels? Did He ever say, take up your swords and gather together weapons and gather together an army and let's fight the Romans? Did Jesus ever say anything like that? No, He didn't. They accuse Him of stirring up rebellion, trying to uh, throw off Rome. And they accuse Him. Here's Here's the one thing they accuse Him of that's actually true. They accuse Him of claiming to be a king. That's actually true. Jesus is, uh, he is a king, right? We'll get to that in a minute. But the idea here is they were accusing him of many things. They were bringing up as many things as they could, hoping that something would stick. Hoping that Pilate would think one of these accusations is worthy enough, one of these accusations is serious enough to put Jesus to death. They were just throwing as much as they could, hoping that they could get Jesus in trouble with Pilate. Now, I don't know about you, but I really like non-stick frying pans. Anybody with me on that? How many people cook in here? Uh, Okay. Anyway, I cook on a regular basis. One of the things that uh, I I like to cook is, is pancakes on Saturday morning. It's a bit of a a uh, bit of a family thing that we do on Saturday mornings. We'll often do pancakes and eggs and all that. And, and I, I like the non-stick, pan, the non-stick pans. But you know what? Every non-stick pan that I've ever owned is always disappointing. Uh, because I still have to use uh, some kind of either a little bit of butter or a little bit of olive oil to make the thing not stick. Now, don't you think that something that says non-stick should be non-sticky? I just think that's the way it should be, but that's not the way it is. If you try and cook pancakes, pancakes in a non-stick pan and you don't put any butter or oil in it, what you find is that half the pancake is stuck to the pan. That seems pretty sticky to me. I've always been disappointed with every frying pan that I own, but every once in a while, I'll see uh, an infomercial. If you watch these from time to time, you I, only, I don't have cable, I just have what the channels I can get off my antenna. But every now and again, I'll see an infomercial. I think it's, uh, I want to say Gotham Steel. Anybody seen that one? Gotham Steel pan. And man, they do all kinds of things to this pan. They, 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 they crack a dozen eggs and they put the thing in the pan and then they bake it in the oven. They put the whole pan in the oven. They pull it out and then the thing just slides out like it's this great big omelet and there's not a thing left in the pan. They, they scrape the thing with metal utensils. Uh, I don't think they've actually run it over with a car, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did that in an infomercial. And then they say, no matter what you do to this thing, it still won't stick, right? I've got this. I, I would re, I, I would, if I thought that was true, I would actually call and buy one. But I have this feeling that it's probably not as true as they make it out to be. It's probably not as great as it sounds, right? Some things probably will still stick to that pan. But you know, that's never true of Jesus. That's never true of Jesus. He's always as great as He sounds. And though they're accusing Jesus of many things here, though they're trying to hurl all these things at Him and hoping something will stick, no matter how many accusations they make, no matter how many insults, They throw at Jesus. His righteousness remains perfectly intact. Jesus never does anything wrong. One of the accusations, though, does catch Pilate's ear. It's the charge of being king of the Jews. Notice what Jesus says to that. 
Pilate asks him the question, are you the king of the Jews? Where does he get that? He gets that because of the accusations that they're making against Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus' reply is, yes, it is as you say. The more literal way to read that in the Greek would be, you are saying so. In other words, Jesus is giving some sort of affirmation here that he is the king of the Jews. Now here's the big question for us. Is he the king of the Jews? Yes, he's the king of the Jews. That was a sad response on your part. Um, Maybe some of the kids would participate to help me out a little bit here. Yes, he is the king of the Jews. Is he only king of the Jews? No. What is he? I like that phrase. The king of everything. It's the one thing that Jesus replies to, but to all the other accusations, notice here, To all the other accusations, Jesus remains silent. He does not respond in any way. And I think the reason why Christ responds to the false accusations, the things are not true about Him, why He remains silent is He's displaying His absolute confidence in God. To us it may appear, as we read these verses, to us it may appear as though Pilate is in control. We we, we might think that Jesus' fate here is in Pilate's hands. Some people might read this and we might think that the Sanhedrin has some kind of control over Jesus. And that somehow they have some power and influence in the situation. Some people might read this and see Satan's hand in here. And I think Satan's hand is in here. Uh, in, in large part. And they might think that he's at work and his power is, is in control of the situation. But over everything, over every power that we can see in this text, over Pilate, over the Sanhedrin, over Satan and his forces at work, over it all is God. And that's why Jesus is silent. He's trusting Himself completely into God's hands. Wouldn't that be nice if we could be like Christ in that way? That when people bring false accusations and charges against us, I'm not saying be a doormat and I'm not saying, you know, don't respond with truth and graciousness, but wouldn't it be nice to have the peace and the confidence and the assurance that, listen, my fate is not in this person's hand who's trying to ruin my life. My fate is in God's hands. And just to rest completely in God. That's what Jesus does here. And look at what happens. Here is Pilate, this Roman governor, this idolater who probably worships a ton of foreign gods who are not gods at all. This man of war and violence who kills people on a regular basis and thinks nothing of it. He sees Jesus' response here of peace and confidence. And look at what it says at the end of verse 5. Jesus makes no reply. And Pilate is amazed. That's the same word that has been used throughout the Gospel of Mark when when people are listening to Jesus and His teaching. They're just amazed by Christ. Here is this this unbelieving man who sees Jesus and he's just amazed that he makes no response. So even this unbeliever, this worshiper of idols, he can see a big difference between Jesus and His accusers. And he sees that the Lord... That Jesus is innocent. you got all these guys making accusations and Jesus just stands there and takes it in absolute confidence and peace. And Pilate sees the difference right away. He sees the difference between Jesus' accusers and Jesus Himself. And Pilate's like, this guy's innocent. For sure. It becomes clearer in verses 6-14. through 14. See if you can hear uh, Pilate's declaration of Jesus' innocence here. Look at verses 6-14. through 14. Now it was the custom at the feast, that is the Passover feast, to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him. 
Besides the representatives of the Sanhedrin, a crowd has gathered before Pilate. And what you need to understand here is that Romans, Roman governors and people who are in charge of things, they would hold court early in the morning. Because if they got all their work out of the way in the morning, then they could have leisure in the afternoon. Right? So this is exactly fitting with what we know of history, that the trial would happen early in the morning. So the Sanhedrin brings Jesus, but there's all kinds of other people that show up to hold court with Pilate. We don't know how many people were in prison, and, and there were probably people there. We know there's more than just Jesus who was in custody here. And people were coming to plead their cases before the governor. In, in verse 10, we're told here that Pilate knows that they want Jesus dead, that the Sanhedrin wants Jesus dead because of envy. They're jealous of Jesus. They're jealous of the crowds. They're jealous of His influence. They're jealous of His wisdom. They're jealous of His teaching. They're envious of Jesus. That's why they want Him gone. Because they feel threatened by Him. So, 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 So Pilate sees that there is no legitimate reason to put Jesus to death. This is purely out of envy. And so he brings up this custom that he has of releasing a prisoner. Now this is uh, common amongst Roman governors who were ruling over uh, people that that the empire of Rome was occupying. It was common for them to release a prisoner every now and again to kind of uh, instill some goodwill between the government and the people. And Pilate's tradition had become, it would seem from the Gospel, Pilate's tradition had become that he would release a prisoner during the Feast of Passover. And he sees that Jesus is there not because of any legitimate charge. He is innocent, but because of the envy and jealousy of the Sanhedrin. And so he asks the crowd, he opens up the question, do you want me to release to you, he says, the King of the Jews, meaning Jesus. So Pilate makes a small effort here to try and have Jesus released because he knows, he sees that Jesus is innocent. Somehow, somehow, we're not told how, But somehow the chief priests stir up the crowd against Jesus. Maybe they had people planted in the crowd that were whispering in the ears of people uh, things about Jesus that made Him look bad. Maybe they had paid some people off before the trial had begun so that they could incite the crowd against Jesus. But however they managed it, they, they turned the crowd against Christ. And before long, the crowd is shouting, to crucify the Lord. And then notice again in verse 14. So we have Pilate knows he's there out of envy. And then in verse 14, he asks this question when the, when the crowd is saying, crucify Him, put Him to death. And Pilate says, why? What crime has He committed? That's what you would call a rhetorical question. The answer to the question is He hasn't committed any crime. But they shout all the louder, crucify Him, crucify Him. And so you see, in this text, through the words and the observations of Pilate, number one, you see that Jesus is completely innocent. He does not deserve to die. And yet, we also see that Jesus is condemned. That's what we see in the Lord Jesus. Is though He is completely innocent, He's condemned. Now that sounds unfair, doesn't it? That sounds unfair. And it is unfair. So that raises the question in my mind. Maybe it raises the question in your mind. Why then does Jesus say nothing when this is so unfair? He's the King of the universe. Why, when He is the King of the universe and has the very power of Almighty God at His disposal, why does He do nothing here? He says nothing And he does nothing. Why does he allow this most unfair event, and it is the most unfair event in the history of the world, why does he allow it to go forward? Because that's the only way that we can receive what's illustrated for us here by a man named Barabbas. He provides a picture for us of what believing the Gospel of Jesus Christ does for a person. 
this, this criminal who's, who's on death row, he provides a picture of the gospel for us. And, and here's, what we, here's what Barabbas has to teach us. Here's what we need to see about Barabbas. is that although Barabbas is truly guilty, he goes free. Barabbas should be the one going to the cross, but instead, he's released. Although Barabbas is truly guilty, he goes free. Let's go back for a second. Let's go up a few verses into verse 7 to see the description of Barabbas. A man named Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. So an insurrection, is that, that, that's a word that, that describes an uprising against an authority or a government, and it often includes some kind of violence. We have to understand that the vast majority of Israelites, the vast majority of Jews living under Roman occupation, they absolutely hated the Roman occupation. They hated the Romans. And confrontations between Jews and Romans happened on a regular basis. And there's all kinds of examples where Pilate puts to death people who were involved in some kind of uprising. We don't know specifically which uprising is referred to here, but we know there was plenty to choose from. And somehow, Barabbas gets wrapped up in this insurrection. He gets wrapped up in this rebellion against Rome. And because these things are usually violent, it may be that Barabbas was the leader of the group. That's a good likelihood, and that's why they ask for him to be released from Pilate. Or he could have just been one of the regular participants in it, but for whatever reason, he was there. And in the fighting, in the violence, Barabbas kills somebody. Probably a Roman official or a soldier. And Mark here, notice here that Mark leaves absolutely no shadow of a doubt as to Barabbas' guilt. Right? He doesn't say he was in prison awaiting a trial because he might have killed somebody. That's not what Mark tells us. What it tells us is that he was in prison with the insurrectionists because he had committed murder in the uprising. So he's absolutely guilty. Now we need to understand that the prison system in the Roman world is not like the prison system that we have today. We can go through the province of Ontario and we can go through uh, much of Canada and we can find prisons that house hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of prisoners for long periods of time, right? In the Roman world, none of that. They, the, the jail cells, the prisons they had, they were only built to hold a few people at, to, at a time. And do you want to know why? Because the prison system in Rome or the legal system in Rome didn't take very long. If you were in jail in Rome, if you were in prison in Rome, the odds are you were waiting there to be killed. And the odds are that it wouldn't have taken long. Oh, there were some exceptions to that. If you were a wealthy Roman citizen or you you were a citizen in Rome like the Apostle Paul, for example, they may keep you under what's known as house arrest, which means you need to provide the house, you need to provide all your food, you need to provide all your clothes, and you need to wait there until we try you. Right? But there was, no, there was no jails like we have today. If you were in jail, you were either released, <laughs> which hardly ever happened, you were sold as slaves, or you were condemned to die. Now, in, in the Roman world, it didn't take much to condemn you to die, and Barabbas is guilty of murder. So what do you think, what do you think Barabbas is waiting around in prison for? He's waiting around in prison to be executed. He's probably scheduled to be executed that day. In fact, some commentators think that Barabbas was going to be crucified with the two thieves that are crucified, one on Jesus' left and one on Jesus' right. And if that's the case, and I think it probably is the case, if that's the case, then the cross of Barabbas becomes the cross of Christ. That's what happens here. So where Jesus is innocent, Barabbas is guilty and deserves to die. So why tell us this? And it's in all the Gospels that Barabbas is let go and Jesus is condemned to die. Why in the world tell us this at all? 
Is this important to the storyline of Jesus going to the cross? Could we have learned the story of Jesus going to the cross without having Barabbas in the story? We probably could have. So why in the world does Mark include this in the Gospel? Why does God think it's important? Why does He inspire the writers of the Gospel to put this in here? Here's the answer. And it's difficult for us to hear. We are Barabbas. That's why this is here. You want to insert yourself? In, we're, we're, so, we're so inclined to put ourselves in the position of Jesus here in our lives. Right? That we're treated unfairly. That people have done us wrong. And they, you know, we've suffered all this injustice. And we're, we're so inclined to see ourselves as innocent and, 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 how light, and how unfair life is. That's what we're inclined to see ourselves. We're inclined to insert ourselves as Jesus into this story. That's not who we are in this story. Or in this account, rather. We're Barabbas. Now you say, hold on a minute there, Mike. I am not a murderer, for which I am thankful that you are not a murderer. But have you read the Sermon on the Mount? Where Jesus says, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty of murder. Have you read the Ten Commandments recently? The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. That is, there should be no place in your heart, in your life, that is higher, uh, that, is, that, that you attribute to something else other than God. Like, there's nothing in your place, in your heart, and in your mind that should have a higher place than God. How many times have you broken that commandment? How about kids? Honor your father and mother. Break that one ever? In your life? How about taking something that doesn't belong to you? How about lying? How about misusing the name? How about misusing God's name? It doesn't take very long if you're honest with yourself to realize that we have a deep, deep problem with sin. You know, video cameras are uh, amazing things, and it seems like video cameras are everywhere these days. I mean, if you have a smartphone in your pocket right now, you're carrying a video camera with you. And it seems like everything nowadays is caught on tape. But just imagine for a moment, you had a video camera following you around and recording everything you have done since the day you were born until today. I know some parents try for that, but I don't think anybody's really accomplished it totally. But imagine that was the case for you. You had a movie of your life. It'd be boring, wouldn't it? You had a movie of your life every moment of every day from the moment you were born until today. Now ask yourself a question. Would you want everyone to see that movie? Would you want everyone to see every part of that movie? Most of us would probably say no because we know that we've done things that we're not proud of. We know that we've done things that are wrong. The reality is we are guilty of sin against God and against people. And if we could think rightly for even a moment, we would see that the accusations that could be brought against us are far more than we first would think. When I was thinking of when I read the words of the chief priest accusing Jesus of many things, I, the thought came into my mind, who is our accuser? And Revelation 12, verses 9-11 through 11 came into my mind. And in Revelation 12, verses 9-11, through 11, we're told there that Satan is constantly accusing, making accusations against God's people. He's constantly telling us, you're not good. You're worthy of hell. You should be judged by God. Right? The constant accusations of Satan against us. And you know what? They're all right. They're all true. We are Barabbas. 
If we could see that, then we would see that our own merit, if, when we try and, when we try and uh, come before God in our own merit and our own goodness, we would, we would see it as a prison. That when we try and trust in ourselves, when we try and uh, think of ourselves as good before God, that's just a prison that's holding us, awaiting the time where we receive condemnation from our judge. That's Barabbas. He's in prison. He's guilty. He's genuinely and truly guilty. And he's awaiting condemnation from Pilate. Or maybe he's already been condemned by Pilate and he's just waiting to be marched out to be executed. That's us. That's us. But our judge is no mere Roman governor. Our judge is Almighty God who is absolutely holy, who sees and knows absolutely everything that you've ever done. There is a movie of your life from the moment you were born to right up to today. And God has seen it all. Everything God has seen. And He leaves no sin against His infinite glory unpunished. He punishes it all. He judges it all. That's us. We're Barabbas. We're guilty. Now, I, I probably should have said this a few minutes ago. There's a good news here. There's, a good, there's good things for us at the end of our text. Look at verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Pilate had offered the release of one prisoner, and here stands before the crowd one who is innocent, that's Jesus, and one who is guilty, that's Barabbas. And because the crowd is in such an uproar, I mean, you could just imagine a hundred or two hundred people shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And because Pilate is a pragmatic politician wanting to satisfy the crowd to not have an uprising right there in his palace, he makes the decision to release the guilty man and sentence the innocent man to die. What's the picture there? The picture there is Jesus takes the place of Barabbas and Barabbas gets to go free. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. God is not like Pilate. He's not being pragmatic. He's not satisfying an angry mob. But He's being loving and gracious and kind. And He's satisfying His own just and righteous anger against sin in the Lord Jesus Christ going to death instead of us. And our freedom, Barabbas gets to go free here from Roman authority, and he gets freedom for a time at least, but our freedom is greater than the freedom of Barabbas. He's freed from the judgment of Pilate, but we are freed from the eternal wrath of God. Not only are we free from His wrath, but He adopts us as His sons and daughters for the sake of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is true freedom, brothers and sisters. And that is the great exchange of the Gospel. We are guilty. Jesus is innocent. And Jesus takes our place. He takes upon Himself our guilt and places upon us His innocence and His righteousness. And so the question comes, do you know that you're guilty this morning? If you know your guilt, do you know that there's a Savior? If you know that there's a Savior, have you put your faith and trust in Him today? You see, if you know your guilt, if you know about Jesus, and you trust Him, then you know the good news of the Gospel. The great exchange. The innocent for the guilty. We're guilty, and Jesus dies for us so that we can go free. That's the great exchange. Let's pray together. Lord, You have given us a great picture in this man, Barabbas. I have no idea what he did after this day, Lord. 
No idea whether he appreciated the significance of what was happening. No idea if he gave a second thought to the Lord Jesus Christ at all. But I do know, Lord, your intention in giving us his account here is to give us a picture of what you do for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, this is such good news, and I praise you and thank you for it. Lord, it's, it's news that most of us have heard many, many times in our life, but God, it never loses its glory. It never loses its delight. And I pray that it would be the delight of all of our hearts as we come to the end of our time together this morning. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.